uh, is I'm going to open up now the uh, our, our our Skype lines. So I declare the Skype lines open, uh, and uh, you can give me a call if you want to. Um, we'll be here tonight. And uh, first of all, there's Josh Wheeler is is calling, and uh, let me uh, let me see first if we are uh, if we're uh, going out. Oh, we are going out. Okay. And let me put on the screen here so you can see. Uh, there, there's, uh, there's Josh. Hello, how are you, Josh? Let me, uh, let me see. Well, how are you? We okay, are. wait a minute. I got to turn something off. Are there. you on live stream too? Yeah, we're we're on live stream. You're on as live well. stream as well. Yeah, and then we add Mark Thorner here. See, there's uh, there's Mark. Hello, Mark. How are you this evening? Well, good evening, Alex. So you knew Mr. Mike, huh? Huh? Oh uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. that's uh, Mr. Mike, of course. Yeah. I had a very interesting happening with him where I scared the living crap out of him. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And it was at a club, and I didn't realize that was interesting. That was the night I met John Belushi also. Yeah? Yeah. It was at uh, Club 57 at Ir Irving Plaza, which puts this back in 83, 83 yeah. no, 82, because... For other reasons, John was just finishing up the movie Neighbors. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that a friend of mine who's a musician by the name of Chuck Hancock mm -hmm. was in one of these bands. And after he is set, I went to find him. Mr. Mike was, first off, you could see Mr. Mike in this crowd of hardcore punk rockers. It was like a light shined on him. He was wearing, you know, that white suit with the white Panama hat. Yeah. And... And it was like, oh, my God, it's Mr. Mike, you know. I'm, of course, I'm the only one that notices this, probably. Anyway, I find my friend Chuck. He's talking to some girl. But behind him, looking right at me, is Mr. Mike talking to a, another girl. And just the position, he sees me coming towards him. Mm -hmm. And back then, I was a really scary-looking dude. I mean, I had the leather jacket, you know, not a mohawk or anything. But he, you know, probably Mike thought he was dead. Uh, he didn't know who I was from Adam. I tap my friend Chuck on the back. He turns around. Oh, oh she, uh, the girlfriend's saying good night. I see her. I'm supposed to tell her you love her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. That's no prize. Anyway. So, anyway, I got to tell you what I got to oh, tell you. Wait a minute. Hold, hold on a second. Before, while you're finishing the, before you finish the story, uh, uh, David Hadjack, is that how it's pronounced, David? Yes, Alex. It's David from Philadelphia. David from Philadelphia, and this is your first timer tonight. Yeah, it's the first time. I'm very happy to speak with you because you're my great influence on my life. You're my hero. I used to listen to you on Sirius XM, <laughs> and uh, you're you're the man. I hope you're gonna write a book. <laughs> I really like your show, and finally I can speak with you. It's Every, a pleasure. Everybody wants me to write a book. By the way, I forgot to mention also Rick Horn has joined us as well, and his lovely wife. Today they are together because he's not on the road. He's not in some dingy hotel room somewhere. That's Enjoy. right. Now let's get back to uh, Mark Thorner who was talking about so, his, his, so, his running with uh, Michael O'Donoghue. Well, so I tap my friend Chuck on the shoulder. He turns around, doesn't realize I'm Thorner. He jumps on me and plants this kiss on me. And the look of relief, I'm looking at Don, Donahue, and the look of relief, I realize, oh, my God, he thought he was I was going to come after him, you know, for whatever reason. So, yeah, I, I, I Mr. Mike Minute, you know, um, mm -hmm. I was scaring the crap out of the poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, I first met Michael uh, when I was working at WMCA in New York, and I, w but prior to being at WMCA in New York, uh, yeah, at WMCA in New York, I uh, had worked in uh, in uh, Chicago and I had worked in Minneapolis. And when I was, I think, in Minneapolis or Chicago, I had picked up this book called "The Life and Times of Phoebe Zeitgeist," uh, which was which was a book that Michael wrote with uh, somebody else uh, who did the artwork. Springer. And, uh, Springer. And uh, it was, uh, the whole premise of it was, it was a whole adventure comic about a woman who in the very first frame practically dies, and now everybody is dragging her body everywhere. And it's all about dragging this body all over the face of the planet and her adventures. <laughs> uh, and when I got to New York, 
I said, this is the first guy I want to have on as a guest on my show. <laughs> Because this is so sick that this is the kind of this is the kind of person I want to have as a guest. So I found him. I tracked him down. He was working for Grove Press, and uh, Michael became an instant friend of mine at that point. And then he went to work for the National Lampoon, and so I got to know him. Uh, I knew him at that point. Got to know all the people at the National Lampoon, and uh, uh, so consequently, that was my history with uh, with uh, Mr. Mike, as you call him. But he was he was a brilliant guy. Died very young, yeah. And, and was very sorry to hear it because he was he was really terrific. Let me uh, let me I'm 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 uh, always quizzical of a, a new person. By the way, let me let me just get a few of the the uh, things out of the way of telling people who maybe have never heard this program before because we are going out also on live stream and that uh, talks to a lot of you know gets out to a lot of people with a notification that we're on. And so all of a sudden they see this, they wonder what it is. We're actually doing a radio program, and we do it uh, on gabroadcaster.com, and it's a 24-7 network stream. And the way these kind people have just called me is using something called Skype. It is a um, uh, um, voice over Internet protocol, and you simply go to sc skype.com, download their program, answer a few simple questions, and then call us, and our handle is Great American Broadcast. You just type in Great American Broadcast, all one word, and then like David here, you can be on our program. Uh, and we could use some more people, folks. Uh, I don't know uh, how many of you are out there tonight, but, uh, uh, oh, you know, as soon as I went to TV, uh, it immediately went down. It's amazing. A lot of people switch over to the TV. That's why I'm only going to do it once a week, because I, I like to see good numbers on the uh, on the radio end of it. But anyway, if you're out there, uh, we would love to hear from you. We'd love to have you call us and, and talk with us and, and join the, in on the conversation. Now, David, tell us something about yourself. Obviously, you're not from around here because there's an accent. Yes, that's right. I came here from Czechoslovakia in the 90s. Mm -hmm. I'm from Prague. Now I live in Philadelphia, PA. Mm-hmm. And I must tell you, when I when I came to the to the United States in the 90s, I thought it was a paradise for me. I I had only one job, I had health insurance, I had 401k and everything. Yeah. And nowadays it's terrible that <laughs> I'm thinking about to move back to Europe because the this country is not as it used to be. And uh, I don't know what to do sometimes. So what you're you know? saying is when you came here, it was offering you a lot of promise, and now yes. it isn't offering you a lot of promise. No, not can, at all. Can we tell that to all those Republicans down in Washington who think things are wonderful and hunky-dory and this is the uh, land of opportunity? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, when I was a kid, I liked uh, Ronald Reagan. But I think that if Ronald Reagan was a candidate, they they wouldn't even let him to be in the Republican Party because they would think that he's he's leftist yeah. nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. Now, of course, you left Prague at a time when uh, what was it was that after the that was after the fall of communism, right? Yes. Yeah. Prague became a fairly affluent place to be. A lot of Americans made that their destination and did a lot of work over there. Oh, absolutely. Like about 100,000 Americans live in Prague nowadays. Mm -hmm. I had great American teacher when I was in high school in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Great guy. And uh, he was the reason I, I came to the United States in the 90s. And really, I... I loved it back then. It was great. You know, I was like, this is it. I'm very happy. But as the time time went by, yeah. you know, it's, it's a disaster. I'm very, very disappointed. I never been, I, I have never been so disappointed in my life. Like really? right now. Boy, I hope somebody in Washington is listening to what you have to say, you know? Now, what, 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 what do you what do you do for a living? In other words, what, uh, what I'm a you... I'm a mechanic for for Toyota. Mm -hmm. I was laid off in 2008 uh, when the crisis started back then. Yeah, and they hired me back like in September 2013, and I'm getting the same wage like I was getting back in 2000 2008. Wow. 
you know. And basically, uh, I'm hoping they're gonna do something about that minimum wage because because it's a, it's a disaster what's going on. Yeah. Did they hire you when they hired you back? Did they hire you back at less than you had been making when you no, worked they, for them before. No, they they gave me the same rate, but they 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 don't give benefits anymore. When I started there at 2003. That's interesting. That's interesting because usually the Japanese, the Asian companies, are pretty good about this. I mean, my wife works for the Chinese, and we're getting full medical benefits. She gets a, a really a nice. Um, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, bonus at the end of the year, um, so uh, it, it it really uh, uh, you, you know you they pay, they pay Alex. they pay this her really well. This is a dealership. Well. Huh? Yeah. it's a dealership. It's, it's, oh, it was it's a dealer owned by an American guy. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was gonna say, David. Uh, I, I'm I'm an ASE master technician as well, and I worked in a Chrysler dealership um, when I went to, as I was going to school and. Uh, now I'm a heavy equipment mechanic, but that's what I was going to tell Alex was, despite the company at Toyota, you work at a dealership, it's just a franchise that sells Toyota cars, so they can hire uh, and pay whatever they want, and I imagine you probably suffer the same fate that I did, where you're paid flat rate rather than hourly. And, no, no uh, I'm hourly. Okay, so you're one of the lucky ones, but you know they still, they still overstaff the shop and don't have enough work and you end up like you said you end up getting stuck and car dealerships are notoriously bad for having terrible benefits anymore yeah 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 but when i started there they paid completely my medical insurance they paid 389 dollars now they don't pay anything well right. you know what what's happening at various companies like well, when I was uh, all I can talk about is Sirius because it's the only company where I was actually an employee over the years. Uh, prior to that, I had been contracted. In fact, the first couple of years I was at Sirius, I was contracted. So I can I can speak because I worked as an employee there as to the insurance. And I remember when I first went there, I think we contributed to the insurance, and it was like sixty dollars a month or something, uh, maybe less than that. And now, for my wife and I, it was getting up around two hundred and fifty dollars a month. You know, so really, this whole idea that you even get health insurance—you get it, but man, it's a nice chunk out of your paycheck for your part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. So what would you, so you could go back to the Czech Republic, I guess, and work. Uh, that's the great I, thing I, about. I it. don't know. I'm thinking moving to my sister in England to London. Yeah, and, and well, in London, but still you walk into a car dealership and you've got a skill, you know. That's something I don't have. I can't just walk into a, you know, I don't have a skill where there are a lot of opportunities available to me. You know, so uh, uh, so I'm sitting here unemployed. Uh, very few people, I, <laughs> I should stand on the corner with a big sign saying, we'll work for a radio show or something, you know. Uh, but anyway. Uh, let me see here. Where is everybody tonight? Is this the last night of like the final five or something? Is that where's what... Patrick? Huh? Where's yeah. Patrick? Where's Patrick? Yeah. Where yeah. Where are all these people? Yeah, last night we were had a full house at one point, so I, I don't know where he is. Uh, but uh, final eight, Alex. Yeah. Huh? It's the final eight. Oh, and when's the final four? The elite eight is the elite tonight. eight is tonight. Final four, I guess, over the weekend. So it'll be over Monday. Thank God. So I won't be competing with that anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> now you're. You, I guess you're. I guess uh, our big. Uh, you, what were you gonna say, uh, David? Yeah, I just. I just wanna say that, like, really, like, uh, I really like your show. Like your show on Sirius. I listen to it every day. I'm very sorry that they let you go, and you're a huge influence on my political views. And you, everything. You mean I, I change down your I change you from, I change and you. I really appreciate your show. You mean I change you from a guy who loved Ronald Reagan to a guy? Uh, who, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Your quotes about capitalism that it breeds greed, that the fuck capitalism, like you said, because really I can see it in my my workplace, because my boss he has changed from 2003 when I started. Like now he's he's like terrible he's like he's like terrible Republican you know who who would do anything to cut benefits 
you know, who, who makes our life miserable. They get very greedy. It, you oh, know, yeah. it, it, capitalism, un absolutely. unfortunately, capitalism does yeah. breed a great deal of greed. Um, uh, I, actually, I should ask, uh, I should ask uh, 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 Josh for his, his opinion on this. Uh, would you say that capitalism bre breeds greed? Josh? Oh, abs yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, no doubt. I mean, like uh, I think I even mentioned one time before, you know, during this the Great Depression era when there was this huge debate, I, I can't seem to recall the uh, the member of Roosevelt's Brain Trust that that said it, and he may have even gotten it from somewhere else. And he just said, you know, the problem with capitalism is capitalist. <laughs> you know, I mean that's that's the problem. Yeah, it's it's not so much the system as it is the parts that make up the system and the parts of the people. And people are inherently, by their nature, greedy. And if you don't put them in a system that checks that greed, it goes unchecked. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, David. Yeah. B by the way, have you seen the document, uh, Inequality for All, Robert Reich? Great documentary. Uh, inequality uh, for All. Inequality for All, I mean Robert Reich. Yeah, yeah. Well, Robert Reich Fantastic. is... Fantastic. Have I Netflix? He, he, he's very you good. you have Netflix... Yeah, he's he's fantastic. He's very good. He's been very good at explaining these things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, I he, can only he recommend also, it to everybody. He also does it a lot on uh, on uh, YouTube, uh, YouTube, and so on. Yeah. It turns out these little uh, primers on uh, on the economy. Some people say, though, I mean, the people who disagree with him obviously say that he's wrong. You know, no, that, he's not. that he. He he's overstating stuff. Uh, do you have you watched any of them, Josh? Uh, no, I haven't seen that particular documentary. But what I think, but goes I'm, wrong, I'm talking about the things that Robert Reich has been doing, the writing and so on. Uh, the, oh yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty familiar with Robert Reich's uh, with yeah. his work. Uh, I know he does the little videos and things, and I've I've seen many of those. I haven't seen that exact documentary though. But I'm I'm pretty familiar with his work. He leans almost as far left as I do. Uh, I think he's pretty pretty far left, you know. Right. I mean, That's why I, I said almost. You see, I mean, here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with – I've often said there was nothing wrong with capitalism as long as it was mom-and-pop capitalism. You know, that mom-and-pop could run a local store and not be run out of town by somebody trying to uh, corner the market. But, I mean, the fact is mom-and-pop don't have their own stores anymore. I remember the time where, you know, our grocer was the guy down the street on the corner – who had this store, and he had a little butcher shop there, and he, he, he sold all kinds of food and things like that. And we knew him, and it was, you know, it was a friend. And that got replaced by the supermarket. And, and so now mom and pop don't run the store anymore. They run the bagging concession at, uh, at a supermarket. Uh, and it, that's sad. That's not ca to me, that's not productive capitalism. All the, 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 the purpose of a corporation has changed. You know, years ago, you started a business. You wanted to have that business stay for a long time, hand it down to the family, whatever. You were proud of what you did. Yeah. Now, you go into that business hoping that you can sell it to some large conglomeration, and they're going to buy you out, and then you've got it made for the rest of your life. And once they take over, they don't care about the employees. They're just going to use everything, get rid of all the high-paid people, and yeah. try to go, you know, let's get kids out of college and pay them nothing. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a virulent form of capitalism. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it, so, I mean, I think, that's what, uh, I think that's what David has probably run into more than anything else is this, is this the, 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 you know, anything taken to an extreme is bad. You know, inherently, there was nothing bad with communism in and of itself. It was taking communism to an extreme. Uh, if you took socialism to an extreme, it would be wrong. By the way, we're being joined by Scott Labram. Hello, Scott. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's taking things to an extreme. I mean, I, I'm not that much of a fan of communism because, quite frankly, I don't think it's practical. Okay, I, do, I, I think it only works on a small scale. If you've got a little village, yeah, being communist is not a bad idea. You put all your stuff in the grain house and you all share it and, you know, all of that. But if, if you're running a, comp a country that's got 1.5 billion people in it, like China, uh, or 1.2 billion, I think, I think I overestimated it, 
and then you try to apply that communist ethic, uh, it's it really doesn't work. It really yeah, but, doesn't work. But I think what happens a lot of times is that people get confused when you start having a debate over having a you know a communistic system or a socialistic capitalistic or whatnot. Yeah. And they tend to confuse the economic system with the governmental system, failing to realize that it's entirely possible to have a socialistic uh, economic system, for example, and still keep the same government that we have now. You know, the, the reason that people fear communism mm -hmm. wasn't so much of communism itself. It was because it was combined with a totalitarianism government, such as in Russia or such as, uh, you know, in the Iron Curtain that, that took over, you know, Czechoslovakia, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think that the communistic economic system is what bothered the people who live there as much as it was the totalitarian well, that, government. Well, that, that's, you know? that's what I've said over and over again, is right. that we had a guy in South America, Salvador Allende, uh, down in uh, Chile, uh, who uh, uh, was the president, and he was a communist, but he was a democratic communist. I mean, mm -hmm. there was no stifling of the press. The press could write anything they wanted to. He wanted free and open elections. But he wanted the country to be a communist country. Now, there is the United. it was not in the best interest of the United States to have any country say that they were a democratic communist country because that, that flew in the face of everything they were trying to say to scare us, okay? Mm -hmm. And the bottom line on it was, uh, 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 who's making noise there? Where, where's all that crackling coming from? Uh, 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 Scott, are you still there, by the way? Uh, yeah, I can't get a picture this time. You can't. Yeah, you're having a problem getting a picture. Maybe you might want to sign off and try again. That could be. Uh, but anyway, what I was saying was is that they, they, uh, the United States did not want Americans to think you could have a democratic communist country. They wouldn't get flew in the face of everything they ever taught in the schools. Oh. Uh, because I remember once I had to read a, a, an article in a textbook that was called Communism Versus Democracy. And I went, that, that's ridiculous. Uh, you know, communism the, the, versus that, democracy. Yeah, that, that doesn't exist. No, it, it, well, I mean, you could have a, a democratic, you could have a, a, a capital, excuse me, a democratic communist country. You could have a totalitarian capitalist country. And we do, mm -hmm. do have some of those. I mean, what is Russia but a totalitarian uh, capitalist country now? The only right. thing they haven't changed in Russia is the totalitarian part of it. Right. Um, yeah, they've, they've scaled it back some, I think, you know, of course. Uh, they don't particularly lock people in Siberia anymore, but, uh, but you're right in many ways. It's, it still somewhat has those uh, remnants there. Yeah. But, yeah, the, I just don't understand why people can't distinguish – uh, you know, between the two, and we have so many people who fear, uh, you know, socialism or, or, or whatever form you might want to bring into it, mm -hmm. and, you know, and they all love the Constitution, but, I mean, you know, there's no mandate in the American Constitution that says we have to have a capitalistic society. There's no there's no mandate that says we can't have a socialistic, you know, economic system and, and still maintain the same, you know, three-branch government division of powers. I understand there may be some things in there that may limit how far it could go, yeah. But there's, you know, those words don't appear in in that in the Constitution anywhere. Why not? Why right. can't we change? Why can't we evolve? Is what I've always failed to understand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Rick. Now we do have socialistic uh, elements of, of our government. You know, you take social services, you take the fire department, schools. They they're there. People just the average person just doesn't understand. That that's socialistic, and that if you provided health care as an example, it's a good thing. It's not a negative. But they're, they're they're so scared of the label of socialism or communism, and they you know they, they don't even understand what the terms really mean. Well, need. When, you know when they when people say to us, um, "What do you want us to be a socialist country?" We're not meant to be a socialist country, and I say. <laughs> You don't like socialism? Well, then the next time there's a fire, we won't send the fire department out to your place. And the next time uh, uh, you you get robbed, we're not sending the police out to your place. Because what is that but a part of a socialistic system in which everybody puts in money to get the go common good taken care of? All right? Uh, and so what, what's wrong with socialized medicine? I mean, it's just another step, you know? I mean... The, the nature, the idea that this country is a totally a total capitalist country, I mean, wouldn't that be a horror? 
I mean, do, do you really want your fire department being uh, sold to the to the to the highest bidder? No, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's ridiculous, right? Or or do you want it privatized, where firefighters are hired without union and paid, you know, ten fifty an hour? Yeah, and and they're not hardly, uh, they're barely trained because training costs money, and um, money equals less profit. Um, yeah, I, you know, that you're right. I mean, there are certain elements that just can't operate that way. And in my mind, we haven't reached the full number of elements and made that decision yet. We have some that are that we accept, but there are others that I think we could easily accept, but we don't. And the reason why is, is I think it's educational. It's just like Rick said a minute ago, people just don't understand the difference. And I just, I just think it's a lack of education. They should teach the difference between communism, socialism, this, that, and the other in schools, and they just don't do it. You know, well, because, Albert and I have had that discussion before. That's not an easy answer on a test. Well, I mean, but, but you, you are, you know, you're brainwashed in school, too. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, I've often said that I felt that uh, schools, boy, Scott is having more trouble tonight. Uh, you still, they're still there, Scott? No, he's gone. He's toast. Wow. Uh, by the way, we could use some more callers if there's anybody out there tonight. Great American broadcast. We're not even getting some of the regulars tonight. I don't know where they are. Uh, but uh, in, in, And Albert had quite a few people tonight. So come on, folks, call. Um, the uh, I often felt that what was happening in schools is that you go to school, you're given a test, then you're supposed to answer the questions to that test. And there was a guy by the name of Dr. Banish Hoffman who wrote a book called The Tyranny of Testing. And his premise was that testing was tyrannical because every question has more than one answer. Uh, and um, he felt that testing was simply a method of programming the person taking the test. In other words, if you spit out exactly what they wanted to hear, then that was... Uh, what they wanted out of you. They, in other words, you're being programmed. You're like a little computer, and they're programming you. Uh, and so, oh, communism, bad. Democracy is the opposite of communism. Uh, well, democracy isn't the opposite of communism. Capitalism is the opposite of communism. The opposite of democracy is totalitarianism. Am I right, Josh? Correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. Yeah, I would go with that. Yeah. So, you know... Uh, we get programmed to say these things and and to uh, um, to, to uh, uh, spit back the right answer. And if we don't spit back the right answer, uh, we don't get gra we don't graduate. So yeah, and giving the right answer has absolutely nothing to do with learning. Yeah, you know, I told Albert the other night that I thought a smart person was someone who could take one of those tests and get all the right answers. An intelligent person was someone who could get maybe half the answers right on that test, but could take the information that they had and interpret it in a way to apply it to their life. Well, the best, you know, the best to make it work. The best test I ever had a teacher give me, and I and I often said this is the way all tests should be. Is to me, the the um, uh, the the true nature of knowledge is not being able to come up with uh, uh, the right answer. It's to come up with the right question. Uh, because being inquisitive is what gives you knowledge. And so my point was, I, one time I remember I was teaching a course in broadcasting or something, and uh, not one of the better times in my life. And I, I said, we're going to do a test, but it's going to be a different kind of test. I want you to write a test. Ask 10 questions. And, you know, they learn more out of asking 10 questions than they ever did out of having to answer 10 questions. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, all you have, uh, answering, to graduate college, all you have to do is be good at being rote, you know. Right. So. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying is I have, you know, I have real problems with the educational system that we have. And I agree with you about, you know, asking and answering questions. I mean, I have a, you know, a friend is a history professor, mm -hmm. and she still maintains, and most there's a lot of people that agree with her, that the absolute best way to learn yeah. a lot of things, but particularly the best way to learn history is through discussion. Yeah. You know, reading is important, writing is important, but discussion seems to always get the students, this is just what she's noticed and what other professors have noticed, 
you know, the students almost always recall things that came up in discussion. They sometimes recall things that came up in reading, and they only recall temporarily, just long enough to pass a test, things that are going to be on a test. <laughs> yeah, you know? exactly. But, but discussion seems to always be the way that fosters, you know, the, the greatest amount of learning. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I've been joined by uh, Portland Dave. Hi, Dave. Good evening. How you guys doing? How are you doing this evening, Dave? I'm uh, late to the discussion, so I don't even know what you guys are talking about. Oh, so we were I'm talking sorry. about sex and uh, how uh, female <laughs> genitalia and, uh, um, and, and we were waiting for, for, uh, for uh, uh, Tony from Queens to phone in and chime in on female genitalia, but we haven't heard I, I'm not that. buying it, but you know we have a, a vegan strip club here called Casa Diablo, <laughs> which is a, a very... Wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> vegan, a vegan strip club. Yes, okay. They don't so, show any meat? Is that what you're no saying? No meat. The guy, the owner, he is very pro-tofu. Uh, he will hire non-vegan strippers, but he highly encourages that they convert to a vegan diet. So he has a menu Boy. of all uh, vegan dishes. So, you know, you can get your nachos with a little sa ground seitan on top. Yeah. Along with a lap dance. Only, yeah. only Stripper squat and shoot out tofu? <laughs> They don't get but, no, they don't get yeast infections. They get tofu infections. Yeah. But what's funny about this place is that uh, Corey Booker was actually kind of flirting with one of the strippers from Casa Diablo. I don't know, sometime last year, and it was all over the media. So this place was uh, very successful before. You know, that... there's a show on television. I'm sure you're aware of it called Portlandia. Yeah. And it would be a it almost a bit out of that show to have a vegan strip club. Oh, the guy you know, uh, the, uh, Kumar, really, I, I think he's Indian. He's really funny guy yeah. on the show. Yeah. He actually, if you go to the Portlandia website, he has a uh, visit to uh, Casa Diablo. <laughs> so you guys should all check it out. It's quite funny. How do the people in Portland feel about that show? Uh, I... I think they like it. I mean, we have this chain of brew pubs here called McMenamins. These two brothers, they've basically taken over every cool building in Portland and converted it into a beer hall, whether it was a school that the school district was going to close down to actually a, a, poor, a, farm, a farm for the poor. Yeah. And uh, so this place shows Portlandy and people flock to it. So I think overall... It's a pretty fair representation of the quirkiness. I think that this year they're going with some uh, themes that are a little bit more universal. Yeah. And I think it's probably funnier to a wider audience. But overall, it does capture this stuff. I mean, you'll come to a four-way stop, and it will be the battle of who could be the nicest and you know not go and let the other people go. So you just end up in this standoff where nobody goes. Well, I, I often said that about California, that, that, that people were never very good at, uh, at, at giving the right of way. And I wanted, you know, on license plates, they always have the motto of the state. I thought the motto of the state of California should have been the you go, no you go state. <laughs> Uh, because, uh, but up in uh, up in Portland, is it does it have that kind of quirkiness that is uh, that's portrayed on that show? Uh, it's slowly, I think, starting to disappear because it's becoming more of a corporate city. Prior to Nike and Intel here, yeah. this is basically a logging state, and that uh, and Portland, you know, was a. Uh, uh, always a thriving city, but much smaller than Seattle and kind of a very provincial, very focused in it on itself. I don't think anybody in Portland was trying to make a big splash of the world where, say, Seattle built the Space Needle to impress the world. Yeah. And things are slowly changing here because of, uh, people don't realize it, but Intel has 18,000 employees up here, and this is where they do all their research because there's inexpensive power and inexpensive water. So you have tons of PhDs out here, and then Nike is just thriving. My ex, my ex wife lives there. What does she? You ever talk to her? Yeah, we well, yeah, we talk. You mm -hmm. know, like 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 ex husbands and wives talk though. You know, 
Well, like, I don't know what, you know, what, I, what, no, I was no. engaged and then that fell apart. So I don't know what, you, you know, well, right. like, what do you talk about? Let's see who's joining. Oh, here, here's Rob. Uh, Rob's joining us. He's probably finished editing his rewinds and that's why he's joining that was us. a great job, Rob. I got to say, because I listened to that, you know, Howard wrap up shows and whatever Sam Roberts, what he does for Opie and Anthony and yours was like right there. I was uh, listening and I'm like, if I didn't know, I mean, this sounds as Pro is anything that Sirius XM is doing right now. So good job, Rob, and good job, Alex. Well, so far, for the most part, we're all pros doing this, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, Rob's been in the business, what, since when, Rob? Wow, first job, 1979. 1979, okay. And he was at Sirius XM. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm just delighted that you're doing what you're doing for us. Thanks. I, I uh, took a couple of hours off to sit with my wife and keep her company so I don't uh, completely uh, anger her because uh, <laughs> I'm going to finish up tonight when, when this show is done and uh, Albert's show and I'll do the final edits on uh, on the, the two other rewinds and get them off to you before bed tonight. Yeah, well, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to put them on tomorrow, like uh, in the evening. Uh, and then they'll run through the beginning of the new shows on, on Monday. Uh, I, we, I, Alex, I know you get, I'm, I'm a, a Jew, so I think that. Oh, we well, wait a minute. A then we can't, then we can't talk to you. I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> neurotic. I think, you know, for me, I, I think your frustrations come from, you really want this ex to succeed mm -hmm. and you put in so many hours. And I know when I get into a project and then things don't go, you hit a roadblock. It can be really frustrating. Well, but yeah. I think you really got to be proud of what you're doing because I know there's been glitches, but the, I, I'm, I, I know I talk too much about Sirius XM, but they're on demand for Opie and Anthony and Ron and Fez was down for like two days. So all these people are tweeting. So I tweeted at Sirius XM and I said, I've had your service that's on demand service since day one and it's been a disaster. That I'm now listening to Alex Bennett on his own standalone service, which is much more reliable. You guys should be embarrassed. And they tweeted back right away and said, this is the first time I've ever heard back from them on Twitter. And they yeah. apologized to me. Oh, really? And I was amazed. And, uh, you know, Opie Anthony and Ron and Fez are just, you know, fed up with it because their shows turn into... Their callers just bitching about the on-demand not working. And overall, I got to say, I use your stuff, whether it's TuneIn, your Android app going online. And overall, it's pretty damn reliable. Yeah, the only, so, thing, the only thing that sometimes gets unreliable is the, uh, is the stream itself, over which I have no control. Tonight, it was down for about, oh, about 10 minutes. And uh, I could not get it to hook in, which, you know, I have no idea where along the line the problem was. I figured out it wasn't here because uh, everything else, uh, I tried all the other machines to see if I could get a signal out, and I couldn't. Okay. Then the next thing I did was I rebooted my, uh, my, my uh, modem. Uh, that still didn't do it. I then checked to see if I could get on to other sites, and I could. So now what that said to me was it wasn't Time Warner, that it was probably your muse, our server in the Netherlands, that was having problems. Uh, but then, and then I called Albert and I said, can you sign on? And he said, well, I just signed on. And then I looked over, he said, and I signed off too. And I looked over and I, my thing signed on. So apparently there was some problem in, in the Netherlands. There are things we don't have control over. We go down about twice a day for maybe yeah, 30 seconds a minute for one reason or another but i've seen us go for two three days without going down at all so is that you know. does that have something to do with the service itself or is that all internet services i mean are there more reliable ones out there uh there are more i have no idea i don't think so let me put it this way there are other we went to your muse because your muse was so goddamn cheap it was ridiculous all right Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I'm streaming all of this in both MP3 and AAC for like 20 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and it doesn't, you don't pay based on the bandwidth you no, use, how many people No, connect. as many, all I can eat. Okay. Right. Meanwhile, if I were to do the same thing over at, uh, oh, who else does this? There aren't a lot of people that do audio only, uh, uh, but it would be considerably more. I use, uh, for the video, I use, um, um, 
uh, uh, live stream. Uh, and live stream, the, the thing about them is 49 bucks a month. But if I went over to your Muse and I got the amount of people I wanted to get, it would cost me like $1,000 a month. So, you know, you got to go looking for these bargains. And I've got to say that your muse for a bargain has been, worked pretty damn well, you know. Uh, but, you know, you never know where the problem is. So, and, is and, Albert on Time Warner or does he have fi uh, Fios? He, he has Time Warner. Do you know anybody who has Fios there uh, in New York City? Uh, it, it, you know, Fios is a phony fucking deal. <laughs> Let me put it th that way. Because okay. I, I looked it up, okay, and I wanted to see if I could get Fios here. Because, you know, Shecky quit Time Warner. Oh, Scott Labram is calling again. Oh, I hope, Scott, that you're okay. Are you all right, Scott? Uh, I still can't get a picture. Oh, well, we don't care. We still have, That's okay, we still have an avatar there for you, so, you know. What the hell? Uh, it, 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 but what was I saying? Oh, I was talking about, oh, about my, Time Warner. But my, all the services my friend go down. I listen online to, KC, to KCRW from Los Angeles, yeah. where I'm from. Yeah. I listen to KCSN. I listen to KEXP, KOPB online. And all of these online streaming services, if you listen to them long enough, yeah. they all drop out. They sometimes stutter. So... You know, even you on the NPR, not on the NPR archive stuff, but if you're listening to an NPR live show, even from their website, mm -hmm. it can happen. So, you know, this is, uh, things are much better than just even a couple years ago. So we should be thankful that it's well, only I'm a very, I'm, you know, I'm, look, it, look, it, 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 it is what it is. And I'm, you know, the only thing is, is that I'm, I'm the, the keeper of the keys here and uh, the keeper of the flame. And when the flame goes out, uh, I'm, I, I then have another crisis in my life, and it's in the next You're room. Right. Uh, it's in the next like room. An uh, engineering student for the summer is a little intern who's, you know, interested in this, and I did that and put up an ad on Craigslist in right. Columbia. Yeah. And then I'd have to have them live with me because they'd have to live with this thing, you know. <laughs> uh, no, nah, they would figure something out. They would be like, oh, no, you just do this, that, and the other. And I swear, because I'm here in Portland, which people don't think of as a tech city, but it really has. And like Airbnb, they're yeah. doing a disannounce. They're moving uh, many people up here, a lot of people from San Francisco. Yeah. So I'm encountering a lot of coders here. I think maybe because it rains during the wintertime. So being inside coding is kind of okay thing to do. Yeah. Uh, is that there's so these young you know, people? You know, you know what? Did I'm, only, I'm 42. I think I'm relatively young, but I talk to like these 26 year olds. Well, and the, the, to them like, you're really you, to them you're really old. I am old. <laughs> like in terms of technology, I I'm I'm feeling dated, and I and I'm pretty on it. You know, the day I knew I was getting dated, and I was only in my in my 30s, I think late 30s, is I met up with this woman. And she was talking to me, and we were talking, and you know, it's all those kind of things you're getting the vibe, right? And she says, "I have a question to ask you. You're married?" And I said, "No, I'm not." And she says, "I have this mother at home." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Okay, I think the day has finally come. You know, the days of b suddenly hitting on people is over with. I'm now going to have to start hitting on their mothers." Okay. Um, and and from and, uh, the other time was when somebody, when two young, good-looking women in there, I guess they were like 19 or 20, said to me, oh, we used to listen to you when we were kids. But I was only 29 at the time. But they were kids when they first started listening to me. So it was very strange. It's, uh, that's when you get to know you're getting old. So uh, uh, have you got, uh, you, you, Dave, you probably haven't met the other Dave here, only he's David. And it's, is it Hajik or Hajik, or how's it pronounced? Hajik. Hajik. And uh, he is from uh, Prague. Uh, I've yeah. been to Prague one time, beautiful city. Yeah, and he's thinking about going at least back to Europe because he's fed up with the United States because of, uh, the, it isn't the land of opportunity anymore. No. <laughs> Uh, not at all. Not at all. What did you do for those years you were out of work, David? Well, because you were out of work. Huh? I was on unemployment. F but not for five years. 
No, no, two, two years. Two oh, years. Two years. Well, you said you got fired in 2008 and then hired back when? Oh, 2000, actually 2009, and then I, I was doing some like uh, construction work, works for cash, you know, and mm -hmm. then they hired me back in 2000, 2000, 2012. Yeah. Wow. Wow. God, that's that's not fun. That is so not you're, fun. you're working again or you're not working? Yeah, I am working. I am working full time for the same wage I had in 2009. Yeah. And no insurance, nothing. They just pay nothing. And I got I got a letter from Blue Cross, the insurance company, and because I'm going I'm I'm, I'm going to be 40 soon, my insurance will be like $469 a month. Four hundred and sixty-nine dollars. So, is, wow. is 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 that Terrible. is that Obamacare? No, it's not. It's uh, I signed with Blue Cross in two thousand nine when Toyota said no more insurance. Okay, but what, what, have you have you checked with uh, like the Affordable Care Act to see? Oh, absolutely, I checked, and it's even more. Wow. That that's exactly why I agree with you that Obamacare it, it doesn't work. We need that. Uh, uh, that that same healthcare like they have in Canada and, yeah. and move Great back, move Britain. Ba move back a little bit, David, so we can see you. You're 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 leaning into the camera, and uh, we can't. We all we see is like your nose. You know. No, I. Yeah. Better than oh, I'm... that's fine. That's good. That's yeah. really good. Yeah. Uh, wait a minute, Rick. You got a question? Yeah, I'm just curious, David. Did you check to see if you were eligible for subsidies under the program? Of course I did. No, no way. No, they said no. Yeah, you have to make literally. You have to make like fifteen thousand dollars a year for them to to give you any kind of subsidy. I mean, I applied for my wife and I because I uh, she doesn't have health insurance where she works. She's the only employee. They have it. We have it where I work. I can't afford it. Um, so I checked on the exchange just recently, just last week, as a matter of fact, and for the two of us. Uh, and then you have to keep in mind, I'm 31, she's 31. Neither one of us have any pre-existing conditions. We do not smoke. We do not drink. I mean, I could pass a, I could take a physical and a blood test, pass it all with flying colors. The cheapest policy for the two of us was just under $500 a month, and that's with an $8,000 deductible. Jeez, so we would have to pay $6,000 in premiums plus $8,000 per calendar year out of my pocket before they would even contribute one single penny okay to our health care the you, only you, thing that yeah. it would ever do any good for is like a catastrophic event and uh that happened outside of work if it happened at work of course that's different coverage well uh, yeah of and course yeah i'm taking a fourteen thousand dollar a year gamble because i don't have fourteen thousand dollars a year if i get hurt that bad yeah. and i'm laid up in the hospital for weeks and they've removed this or that and the bills are a hundred thousand. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm not gonna fucking pay them. I'm not gonna be working well, anyway. If they remove something, tell them to keep it. <laughs> the problem with that is they'll completely yeah. destroy your credit. David? Oh, well, please. no. D David had something he wanted to say here. Yeah, I, I just wanna say that the biggest mistake I made when I think about it, I landed in Chicago in the '90s, and I I had a choice to immigrate it to Canada or the United States. Oh, I I went with, with uh, I went with my best friend, well, and he decided with Canada, and he lives in Halifax, and now he laughs at me that it was a okay. stupid mistake oh, I, that I should have gone with him. Over to you. And oh, I must yeah. say now that he was right. Right next you know? to you on the screen, I have brought up our uh, our guy that goes on at midnight here, Revel Stoke Jim Browning, <laughs> and Jim, tell yeah. him you're he's in Canada right now, Jim. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's it, your friend. Good choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they need a mechanic for the spaceship. <laughs> it made it back, Jim, in one piece. Yeah, I did. But, I did. By the way, Jim, Jim, that was a brilliant show, and we're oh, gonna, we're gonna we're much. gonna rerun it this weekend. Yeah, I uh, so I've heard, and <laughs> I'm 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 touched. Thanks. Now I only have one suggestion for you. What? What? You should have made that a cliffhanger. You yeah, know, I thought. Like well, maybe, I, maybe I you should have been taken over by Somali space pirates. 
Oh. <laughs> you, you, you might be ruining future plot lines. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> Look at me. I'm the captain now. Um, by the way, that is, uh, that is if, for those who, who can see it on the TV the t and can also uh, uh, see, uh, see it because they're here on the uh, panel, on the Citizens Panel, that is a brand new microphone that Jim bought. And I looked that yeah. up. Where are you getting 350 bucks to buy a microphone? <laughs> I have that's the money. Sure, right? Huh? Yes, that's the uh, Sure SM7B. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. sounds great. Oh, I'm 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 really happy with it. I uh, I had read all these things. I mean, it, I, I just read all these things previous that it said, "Oh, it needs a lot of gain it to to get a proper sound out of it." And uh, I had I was concerned, and then I plugged it in on Friday or, or today's Friday. I plugged it in on uh, Wednesday when it showed up, and it was like, "No, it's fine. It works." Wow. Well, it, but it has to be that, on a that's, a, my, that, that's my that was my gift to myself, and uh, yeah, that's it. it. It's a great, great sounds great, yeah. sounds great. Yeah. Unlike yeah. mine, which just sounds terrible. No, yours sounds. Why great. is it? Why is it? I'm getting mic envy. Like for instance, we got the, we got we got we got Rob down there, and look at Rob. Look at Rob. What kind of microphone is that? That's a. Uh, this is uh, your basic um, uh, Samson. Samsung. Samsung. Not a Samsung, but a Samsung yeah. microphone. S -A -M -S -O -N. And I'm, uh, je I'm jealous of his mic because it sounds good. I've got this. This is an AKG right here. Oh, that's what I was using before. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, um, in fact, you probably got it from uh, uh, from Play TV, didn't you? No. no because no. the other one that I have now, I took from the studio that's closing down that turns out was a mic I brought from California that I think was a Mike Play TV gave me. And, oh, and no. so the, I, uh, the one I got from Play TV is the old Wow. Sure. Five five classic. Yeah. Yeah. I it, and, and I've used it a lot. I used it for the uh, the live radio plays that uh, I used to do. But uh, it just I wanted something different and I had seen this one for a while and it was just my choice. So, I, I don't have it right here. I'm looking for it, but I have a, a, an old. Uh, uh, and people, you have to understand, we're talking now about people who use their voices for a living. So, our microphones are our lives, right? And I've never really cared about what microphone I use. I never cared about using processing. I, you know, I wasn't insecure about my voice, so I, I, I you know, it was never a big deal. But the the point was that this thing was a, a Electro Voice 635A. You know what those are? You look at Frank Sinatra singing in the 60s on TV, he's holding a 635A. You see a news reporter out on the street uh, at, uh, at any time during the last 50 years, 635A. Do they still make the 635A? You bet your life they still make the 635A. And if I showed it to you out there, you would say, I've seen that microphone before. I bought it when I was 16 years old. And that wow. thing still works to this very day. And it's been repainted and repainted. And I think I hammered a nail with it once just to show <laughs> it could be done. Best mic I ever owned. And has still has a great sound to it. Yeah. I know that means nothing to anybody who isn't in broadcasting. Right, guys? Doesn't mean a thing to you, does it, Mark? Mm. <laughs> he, no, I, how, how about this, you, this, Dave? This, that was the most. Un, guys, uh, it, that I was, was the most. Un... To uh, Howard when he was interviewing uh, Jerry Seinfeld, and he was talking about that when he first started bro uh, doing uh, broadcasts, he tended to sh shout a lot, so he boosts the compression, and so he finds that when he boosts the compression just to his monitor. Yeah. He doesn't talk as loud and he just things flow out easier. Is there something to the monitor that I never the I never cared. I, I think the one thing I've always cared about, I think uh, I think Rob would agree with me and I'm I'm sure that uh, uh, Jim would agree with me. Earphones are very important because they're your reference. And uh, it isn't that I want an earphone that makes me sound good. I want an earphone that sounds normal and natural. And I always have to work with earphones on. Working without earphones on is like going swimming without your trunks. <laughs> you know, it may feel good, but, you know, your balls get hurt. 
So uh, I, I just, I, I don't know. I just, it, it's strange what we in radio consider important to us. You know, uh, you, I could go blind tomorrow and I wouldn't mind. I could lose both my arms and legs and I wouldn't mind. Speaking of which, where's Patrick tonight? Just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. <It's his> job. <laughs> he probably has work to do. I could have no arms and legs, and it wouldn't bother me. But if my vocal cords went, you know, that would, that would, that would do it for me. If my hearing went, that's why I felt sorry for Rush Limbaugh when he started losing his hearing. Because, you, you, you know, hearing is a very important part of being a broadcaster. Because okay. that's your reference point. And I, st I, I really wonder how Ru if Rush Limbaugh knows how he sounds anymore, whether the, those cochlear implants allow him the same feeling you get. Uh, although there is something to be said for the fact that probably if you're deaf, you can still hear yourself because you're vibrating with inside mm -hmm. your body. So I don't know. I've got hearing loss, and and I I mean the headphones are a, a necessity. I mean I just I can't do things without headphones, and uh, you know I occasionally even put the captioning on the television because I just there are certain tones I can't hear. My wow. wife, being a teacher, she can hear a pin drop, and so uh, uh, we sort of have different levels of sound in the house at times. But uh, no, I uh, I unfortunately early years of of. Uh, construction and, and nightclubs and things like that, uh, my hearing is kind of crappy now. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to ask David something because I'm, I'm curious, David. Anytime we have a new person, we like to pick on them. You've been eating all night. What have you been eating? Uh, sausage and, and roll. Uh, sausage and roll. Yeah, and beer. And yeah. beer. Any mustard with the sausage and roll? No, no ketchup. I ketchup. hate American mustard. I'm sorry. Um, you hate American mustard? Yes. Well, you mean that yellow <laughs> stuff, the French stuff, the French mustard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, oh. it's the worst mustard ever. Well, I mean, it's mustard is paint. <laughs> golden no, mustard. It, well, it, it, yeah, it, it, but we, we, we have other kinds of mustard here. We do have the brown spicy mustard and the, you know, the, the Jean I, I, mustard. I hate spicy food. And uh, so what do you I like to buy mustard in like Polish stores in Philadelphia where I live. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so um, um, Prague has yes. also become a center for pornography. Yes, a yes, lot of European porn is coming yes. out of Prague, and some weird stuff too. I might add. Yeah, you're you're right, but uh, I don't I don't care about porn, so I just know about it. Thanks God, Duck is not calling anymore because he was annoying shit out of me. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it's the only conversation he could contribute to. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I wish uh, Albert dropped Doug because he's so <laughs> annoying. He always slow his show down. Well, I, I got rid of him because, he, because I, <clears throat> I couldn't do a coherent show with him involved yeah. in it. You know. Absolutely. Well, uh, yes, uh, uh, our, our Dave. Since we're talking about Prague and Czech Republic, one I, thing that yeah. I'm more like a business guy. Could you guys explain to me when they say Kafka-esque and what does that mean exactly? Well, you wake up the next morning and you're a cockroach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So well, exactly what did Kafka write about? Does anybody Who knows? know? It's so difficult to understand Kafka, you know. <laughs> you know, he, he he used to live in Prague, I I think in the twenties, mm -hmm. and you know they they made a big deal about it, you know. And uh, I've read I have read Kafka many times, but uh, I'm not into it, you know. It's too depressing, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, Josh, you ever read any Kafka? No. Oh, okay. He's, he's into history. I, I don't know why all my Santa Monica, when I was in Santa Monica, I owned a pub. So I got to know a lot of the regulars who were really involved with the local political scene. And Santa Monica is a very progressive community and basically a one party community. It's uh, renter's rights. Mm -hmm. Basically, Santa Monica and Berkeley were, one, I think, the only two cities in the country that had regulated rent control that even if somebody vacated the apartment, the rental rate that the landlord could set would be dictated by the cities of Santa Monica and Berkeley. And 
So the politics in Santa Monica are very interesting. And my regulars would always reference Kafka, anything that was going on in Santa Monica. And I just, you know, could just never really. How do you I reference mean, Kafka in a beachside community? Hipster. If you've ever been to Santa Monica for a beachside community, it is it is a wacky city. I mean, if you're just a tourist and you hang out along the beach, you just think it's this ritzy Hollywood city. But deep down inside, it probably has some of the most internal politics of any community in the country. Mm -hmm. it, it, for so many reasons, and, and I think the fact that you have one party that their only goal is to represent renters, mm -hmm. that it kind of distorts uh, what the motivation. are. What do you are. mean represents and, renters? What's that? What do you mean? You said represents renters? Right, it's called Santa Monica for Renters' Rights. So ever since rent control went into effect, this organization yeah. basically endorses candidates. And since the mid-60s, mm -hmm. they've controlled at least four out of the seven city council members. There is also, they're really not, from what I can tell, interested in the renters' rights because they charge about 10 times as much as the city of L.A. in terms mm -hmm. of the annual fee for administering the rent control. And they have this uh, uh, probably 30 people who work for them. So, I'm, so, them so I mean, is, is life pretty good there for a renter? For a renter, if you've been locked in a long time, like I had an employee – who yeah. he was paying nine hundred for a two bedroom, and the girls next door were paying thirty two hundred. Wow! Wow! So what happens a lot of times in Santa Monica and Berkeley is you have huge buyout offers from the landlords, and a lot of times the for the landlord, and it, I'm happy this happens. The renter likes where they live. Yeah. They're content. They yeah. don't need any more money. They're not motivated by money. They don't want to move, and they're just there you know, until you know, they I was, die. I was mentioning this the other night. What's what's strange about New York City is, uh, I, I, I guess I can say it now only because some things are, are progressing along. We we had to go out and hire a lawyer, uh, uh, and we had to go out and get a rental a, a rent. What do they call it? A uh, a tenant uh, a landlord lawyer, and uh, I was talking to the guy. And he said to me, he said, you know, I go anywhere else in the country to conventions and things like that. And I tell him what I do, that I'm into lawyer-tenant uh, law. And they went, really? You have a business for that? That, that? You really don't find this kind of law anywhere else in the country, supposedly, he said. And in New York City, for instance, there is actually a housing court. There's a court for all tenant-landlord disputes. So uh, I would imagine, if you're talking about Santa Monica this way, there's another city in which the, perhaps there are lawyers who deal oh, in, yeah. this, uh, in this kind of law. And, and what's kind of interesting in Santa Monica, it seems like whether you're a developer, it's very difficult to get anything through the city. So there are few key law firms that you have to basically hire yeah. to get things done, but they also don't donate to the politicians. So it's kind of hard to know really which side these lawyers are on it's basically you have to pay them their four hundred dollars an hour to get your project through the city and yeah. uh I, I, the more that i learn i used to be mr santa monica and now i'm up in portland and my eyes have been opened up yeah. and what i thought was a well-run city that was really concerned about the well-being of all it turns out uh it's just the same as politics everywhere yeah Politics is politics is politics. Uh, yes, uh, David. Yeah, Alex, I must ask you a question. Uh, how do you see the November election, if I may? The, you mean the, with the with the uh, the midterm elections? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. You know, I really don't know. I, I'll tell you, I don't think any of these things are predictable anymore. I think at one time uh, they were quite predictable, uh, and uh, now they're not anymore. Um, and by that I mean, uh, how can I put it? Uh, there is so much media out there, you know, what with your news networks that all have these pundits, and I think Josh would agree with me on this, that it is really who plays those media the best who's going to win. 
And I don't know. Could we predict that now, Josh? Would you predict what was going to happen? Jo Josh is very much into this and into the history of politics in this country. Do you f feel there's any way you can predict how those midterm elections are going to go? I don't think we'll change much. I think it'll probably just stay status quo. I think Republicans will probably keep the House. And uh, I think they're really optimistic about the Senate. But those elections are really difficult to win. They need to pick up quite a few seats. I don't I don't really see it happening. I The other reason I think it'll stay status quo is you don't typically get huge changeover unless it's a, a truly national election. In other words, you have something at the top of the ticket, like basically a presidential election. Yeah. And those typically, typically seem to be the only elections that carry a real landslide change. You get someone swept into office, they'll bring a majority with them, or they'll get the majority right after at the next midterm. Yeah. So we're just, we're not really in the part of the cycle where I see wholesale change. Except Probably 2010 when all the racists came out. Right. Yeah. There, there are exceptions well, throughout yeah, history. You know, 2010, it's interesting <laughs> is that, uh, I mean, that was pretty telegraphed in 2010. I think they basically let us know months ahead that the Democrats were going to lose the House. Uh, and I, I became quite depressed about it. And I wasn't listening to Sirius XM and I actually tuned in the day before the elections in November. And yeah. it was actually Alex's last day before he left to go to China. So I tuned in and... I really enjoyed your show, and then you said you were going to be gone for two weeks. The next day the election happened, I went into full-blown depression mode, and uh, I tune in, and it's Liz Win Winstead, which was good, but uh, I don't know. It, it's I don't have a lot of confidence, honestly, in this election because I don't blame Obama for anything that's going on in terms of NSA or Benghazi, anything that he gets blamed for, what I blame him for is that he got people's hopes up. Mm -hmm. And especially for young people, I think that I young people me. in 2008, they got their hopes raised and they went out, they voted, they kind of became a little bit more politically involved than they had been. And then with what's happened, they've become disenchanted and they have not seen the change that they were promised. And I can't guarantee how many of these people are going to show up at the polls where the people on the right, they're still angry. They're motivated. And I can tell you here in, in Portland, which is very liberal city, you just get to the outskirts at all. And if it's a non-November election, yeah. the conservatives win the issue 100 percent of the time. Yeah. I get yeah. Back to what Josh said on Albert's show, I think it was last week. Uh, yeah. Josh was talking about how you you know uh, 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 Obama not carrying through with a lot of his um, his promises, and it's we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You don't know what he what he knew when he made those promises, and what he finds out day one when he steps into office and realizes that you know I made those promises, but now I know reality. Well, let's ask the handsome man with a beard, Jim. Uh, what do you think about our American? chances elections he's looking around the room <laughs> <laughs> i looked at everybody's face first to see who had a beard and i was wondering where you were going with this okay well uh, i have one politics. i have one but i was the one talking and and uh, i think uh, uh josh has uh what do you have you have what i got one of, one yeah, of these maybe deals? a little less i'm uh mine is what i call being lazy uh, really? Yeah. You should see what happens around here since I don't go to work anymore. Right. After a couple of days, I'm smelling pretty funky, and I'm my beard is like, you know, I'm surprised this woman is still living with me. Right. I forget to shower anymore, you know, because I'm, I'm not going out. I have nothing to shower for. I used to shower every day before I went to work. You're not going to Costco once a week? I, I shower to go to Costco. Okay. <laughs> so at least I, I get that. <laughs> I, I, Alex, get a life. Yeah, I know, I know, uh, Scott. I we almost forgot you were there because I can't see you. Uh, but uh, well, how do you feel about uh, Scott out there in uh, what Salt Lake City, right? Yeah. How do when you... it comes to politics, yeah, uh, they made me a precinct secretary when I attended a caucus. Yeah. And, and I have no idea what's going on beyond that. Really. Uh, okay, well, uh, that, that that certainly answers that question. How about you, Mark? How do you feel the midterm is going to turn out? I think there's going to be some changes. 
Yeah. You know, down here, I. Well, you're in you're in Florida. Down there, you know. Oh my God. You know the bad I, the bad thing down there is the politics and the guns, and the good thing are uh, school teachers will screw the students. <laughs> <laughs> Which I never that I, that part I never understood why everybody's griping about that. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. yes, if it were a male having sex with a female student, we might start asking some questions and taking names. But when it's uh, when it's a, a woman and a 13 year old kid, hey, man, when I was 13 or 14 and my gonads started raging, I, if I had had a teacher who came along and wanted to do what they were doing and looked like some of those teachers down there in Florida looked. You know, the only the only damage done to me would be to the palm of my hand from high fiving too many people. <laughs> well, uh, you know, what, that, that's what I love about Mark is he makes gestures yeah. which yeah. don't play on radio. <laughs> yeah. Alex, can a, can a woman speak here? Yes, please. Oh, please. Oh. M Mrs. Horn. I gotta, I gotta take exception. Are you Mrs. Horn now or are you still keeping your maiden name? No, I, I, it's, it's Teresa Riley Horn. Oh, okay. Because I'm my, saying, mine is, mine is still Marjorie Miller. <laughs> Nothing don't. else. But as a mother of boys, yeah, I take exception if I would not want, and I'm a pretty sexually oriented woman, and yeah. I'm pretty open. Yeah, I would not want a teacher messing with my 13 year old son. Absolutely. I would actually like. Oh, but a priest want... would be okay. No. But yeah, no, I, and I and I get the whole. Well, now let me thing. let me ask why because let me say as a guy remembering when I was a kid and I think all you guys can remember being kids. All horny. If you had like a you were fourteen and you had a teacher who isn't going to be that much older than you are. She's like twenty three. I mean. If yes. if the, wait, let me finish, it, it, and and she came on to you, or she wanted to do something with you, and you're looking to get laid at that age anyway. You're you know you uh, you really got to ask yourself the question: Is that oh hey Patrick's calling? Is that right or is that wrong? And I I'm not a parent, so I can't I can't attend to that question. But as a kid, I would have loved it if that one of those teachers came on to me. Believe me, I'm sure my boys would have also. Yeah. But as a mother of those boys, I would have killed that person. No, I know, but to us, that's a wet dream come true. Right. What's, the, what's the real harm? Um, <laughs> like me as a mother, how, how would, uh, just think, if you had a, uh, do you have a son? No, no, no. no. So if you had a son, and it's no difference, okay, 13 to, he said 21, all right? So how about... There, I don't know. I, I listen. I'm a mother. You're not touching my son. At okay, this is she's being protected. By the way, Patrick joined us. Are you there, Patrick? Patrick, I am. I'm joining you via my phone because I can't look at my fucking computer anymore. Why? <laughs> I spent seven hours troubleshooting and fixing it from midnight last night till seven tonight with three hours of sleep. Oh, oh congratulations, because that's what I had happen here, you know, a couple of weeks ago. The server computer. I was thinking computer. of you this whole fucking time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and so I, I simply pulled a hard drive from one place, put it in the other, and had to reformat the machine, put in all the programs. I, I, I sympathize with you, and uh, that's why we're only getting uh, a How much coffee have you had? You drink uh, coffee, Patrick? I, Mountain Dew. I had uh, six Mountain Dews and... <laughs> <laughs> Three, four, or five cups of coffee over that time. Well, Mount, wow. Mountain hey, Dew I, is, in fact, the breakfast of uh, of uh, uh, hillbillies. But no, the the, the, the breakfast <laughs> of the breakfast of techies. There's no question about it. By the I way, know you know, you, you know, right now, Alex. right now we have a full house. By the way, what? Why? I, I, I figured out why you don't sleep. Why? You're always drinking the Starbucks. Quote, ice coffee. I drink one of these a day, and it's when I day. do this show. You just said I, today you got to Google it. Starbucks coffee has twice the caffeine of every other coffee, so you need to like cut that out at 10 a.m. I, I, I don't. You can have as much I, as you I, want before I, I, 10 a.m., and then you need to go decaf. I don't think in this stuff. I'll tell you what probably is. I also have over here a glass of Coke Zero. 
Uh, yeah, that's super. High which, too. by the way, I can't drink Coke Diet Coke anymore. This is I I could be a commercial for this now. Yeah, uh, try Coke Zero, folks. It's better than regular Coke. I don't know why. It just I think it tastes. There's more, more caffeine. No, no, that isn't it. I think they formulated it so it really does taste like the old Coke. I just like it better than Diet Coke now. But they're finding though that the beverages that have more caffeine mm -hmm. that you get addicted to it and the Starbucks people I've noticed it the people who are lifelong Starbucks people when you take them away from their Starbucks coffee and yeah. for a couple days on a trip where there's no Starbucks they start acting differently well I... Starbucks is coming to Revelstoke uh, oh really really well time You're to move out caffeine per cup doubled time to move out yeah well there's a big kerfuffle but there's a big kerfuffle. Is that what goes on up in Revelstoke? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, we know, didn't have a uh, civil war up here, but we had a rather large kerfuffle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the funny the local thing about town. Starbucks. 1812, I'll tell you about the 1812 kerfuffle one day. <laughs> <laughs> I bet all 12 of the Tim Hortons they already have in town are worried sick. Uh, <laughs> actually, we have one Tim Hortons, and it's going to be across the street from. No, wait a minute. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about Tim yeah. Horton. Excuse me. Yeah. We keep going. People who are listening are probably saying, why do you bounce around on subjects? And that's because this is like a bunch of people sitting in a living room talking to each other. And conversations go one way, and then all of a sudden something else comes in. You're talking about something else, and then all of a sudden you're back to the other thing. That's what this is. This is a this is sitting around. A, this is my video living room here and with a bunch of people I really like, I might add. But what I was going to say is you always talk about Tim Hortons. Now, I've never heard of Tim Hortons in my life. Great hockey player. Yeah, he was a hockey player. Was he? <laughs> Toronto yeah. Maple Leafs for years. Good defenseman. Really? Yeah. Yeah, okay. and, and uh, he died young. Uh, but uh, one of these businesses that he started uh, years ago was a uh, like a donut shop and a coffee shop. And uh, it's basically... Uh, it's basically... Uh, Canada's chain. I mean, they are. They are in. Uh, it actually started in uh, 1964. Okay. So there really is a Tim Hortons because you come up with a lot of people who live there that maybe I have a suspicion don't live there, uh, or you come up with uh, places that don't, I believe, actually exist in Revelstoke. Uh, but I may be wrong. Uh, actually, uh, Wendy's owns Tim Hortons now. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? Yeah, well, they merged they have for about with, a decade or at least a decade, yeah, decade and a half. Yeah. I'm, getting an, I'm getting an echo from somewhere. Where am I getting it from, I wonder? It's from Patrick. Patrick? No. You want me to go away? I'll go away gladly. <laughs> you really want to get some sleep, Patrick? Is that what it is? I, I No, I, I've, I've been listening to the Empire Strike Back on uh, in a Shakespeare form on audio <laughs> book. Yeah. <laughs> So you haven't been listening to us tonight? No, but I, I needed to give you a call and see how the phone worked. And, uh, you know, that that was really about it. So if you don't like the sound... Oh, no, the sound, the sound's fine now. We don't have just that problem a little anymore. Feedback Did you guys hear that because of all this competition in the breakfast category with Starbucks coming in and yeah. our Taco Bell yesterday launched breakfast, McDonald's from the 31st to, like... April 16th is giving away free coffee. You guys God, catch this one? Who's giving away free today? coffee? You just have to buy the hash brown, uh, egg McMuffin. They're giving away free coffee all, with all any purchase for like 16 days. Hmm. Well, so I think what's going on here, what I'm noticing, I'm an econ guy yeah. and Things are starting to get more competitive. It's like a, it's it's a better time for consumers because all these companies now seem to be struggling a little bit. What happens is is the recession hits, everybody pulls back, so you don't have a lot of investment, not a lot of new stores. Now, the last two three years, everybody's been opening up new locations. There's new concepts, and you have Amazon online putting pressure on everybody. So it just seems like everywhere I go everybody's yeah, offering me a out, deal you, you know what depresses me though is that like for instance with um amazon a company that i do a great deal of business with there's nothing better for a lazy human being than to go online order something and then within two days there's a knock at your door and there it is and by the way if i want to give it as a present 
I'll just simply say gift wrap it. And by the way, here's what I want on the card. It's the, it, it really is the laziest way to shop, it's, and, it, and it has desocialized us completely. But I love Amazon. I must have spent tens upon tens upon tens of thousands of dollars over the years at Amazon, only to find out that the guy who runs it is a right winger. Oh, he's a jerk. And I just go, oh, my God. You know, is, is there no sanctity? Is there nobody I can love anymore? I got to uh, forward my Facebook rant on the guy because if you take a look at what Amazon has done, I don't buy much from them because, one, they've made very little profits. In, the, in their cumulative history, they've made $3 billion in profits. So that means they've paid very little taxes. So they've been in business since '95. Number two, they've scammed all the states out of sales tax. Mm -hmm. Number three, they've put all these mom and pop people out of business who all these mom and pop bookstores pay people pretty well. So that creates taxes for your local government. So basically, yeah. consumers have done well and everybody else has been screwed by Amazon. And then beyond that, let's say you make a DVD and you want to sell it through Amazon. They sell it tomorrow. They pay you in 90 days. Yeah. What type of crap is that? Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, I'll get to you in a second, David. I, I see that you want to talk, so you go next. But I, the, the only thing is that uh, I still, why should I go to Best Buy and pay $30, $40 more for something than buying it at Amazon? Am I not cheating myself? Whether the oh, guy's a right Best wing, a I mean, company. I hate. I feel sorry for Best Buy because they dug their own grave with yeah. bad customer service i mean i go in the yeah. stores and i knew more about the products than anybody who worked there the other the and, other the, and other, the terrible other. experience and yeah. they had their opportunity i don't know if you recall but i think it was two christmases ago they made a big push to compete against amazon mm -hmm. and then they oversold their inventory so the christmas gifts never arrived so they had their one big opportunity where they were matching the Amazon prices, even undercutting it. But then they let so many people down that I think that, that you know, even though Amazon's not a great company, they really, you know, they've held up in terms of as a customer. Well, it saved me a lot of money. Channel. David, do you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to I just want to say that Amazon is trying to open big warehouse in the Czech Republic. And they have a big trouble because nobody wants them there because they don't want to mom and mom and pops, as you said, disappear because of the Amazon. Well, we've just done nothing. Like up in Canada, Jim, they do a lot to make sure the Canadian businesses have a chance, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, if you if you do a TV show up there, at least ten percent of that show or something has to have Canadian content. That's what the joke of the name of your show. Yeah. yeah, well, there's even I think it's even more than that. Uh, I mean, uh, for certain productions, yeah, they uh, they uh, uh, have to have uh, uh, Canadian uh, uh, so much Canadian talent, so much Canadian uh, production, yeah, uh, stuff like that. So uh, yeah, um, and that's why we see so few Canadian television shows here in the United States. <laughs> and there's some very good ones. <laughs> Actually, there's, some very there's good a show. Ones. There's a show I'm watching now that is out of Canada called Bitten. Uh, oh, yeah. The, yeah. I used, Which, I used to work with the CBC uh, when I did television sports. Yeah. I worked hockey night in Canada a lot with, uh, you know, in New York City at Madison yeah. Square Garden anytime they were in town. So I worked a lot with those guys. That with the crazy you know. coat? Oh, yeah. Don, Don Cherry. Cherry. Yeah, I worked with Don, Don Cherry. Cherry. I was a I stage was... manager for Don, Don. Cherry. Oh, yeah. wow. Band of Gold. Uh, it's revered. Huh? In, in a, in a, yeah. 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 Well, I don't know where the slapback is coming from tonight. Sometimes if I turn down the uh, audio from people, uh, it goes away. Uh, no, it seems to have gone away now. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where it comes from. Can, well, can I interject something uh, here? Absolutely. You know, usually you raise your hand, but because can tonight I am. you're... I'm, I'm raising my hand. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you just can't see it. That's right. Uh, and, and actually, I did. It's almost my reflex now, so... Yeah. Um, anyway, as far as Amazon being the big bad Walmart too, um, there's such a thing as evolution and Darwinism in business too. Mm -hmm. And basically, as a conservative, I understand the mom and pop concept and I do support it, but tough shit. Things happen and move on. 
and that I mean it's the same as you know the fucking polar bear if the ice cap melt they're going to learn how to swim and get to land or yeah but what are they going to do what are they going to do about those shrinking penises of theirs mm -hmm. because they say that the polar bear's penises have shrunk now I don't know who went out and did the measurement I'd like to speak to that person but the fact of the matter is that the polar bear's penis is shrinking, and that's not going to make many polar bear females happy. I'll be brief here. Patrick, I'm all for competition, but by uh, Amazon using a loophole and not collecting sales tax and a lot of in, in other states, methods. Wait a minute. You're wrong, there. though, Dave. In states where they, the states have gone out and argued it, they've won. And here in New York, I pay tax on everything. Yes. That and now their sales, actually, if you look in the states where the sales tax has kicked in, yeah, that, so in California, that's 10%. They used to have, in addition to their lower price, another 10% over Best Buy. So from what I've seen from the statistics is that in the states where they are charging sales tax, and mm -hmm. it is a high sales tax, 8%, yeah. 10%, they are starting to lose a little bit of market share. They may be losing a little bit of market share, but they ain't going to help Best Buy. No, it's know? not going to help Best Buy, but it's just a little bit of leakage. Yeah. Uh, just a but, little, well, tiny I, you bit. know, I mean, I, I happen to agree with the Republican in our midst here that, you know, it is it, there is a Darwinism here when it comes to business. Well, it's yeah. interesting, you know, they point when, to what uh, Olive Garden Closing mm. down as the middle class decline. Well, maybe our old yeah. garden just sucks. Rick, you wanted to say something. <laughs> Rick? Yeah, uh, you know, the danger of, of a business like an Amazon, and it happened in the hardware industry with, with Home Depot, yeah. is once they shut down all the competition, you have a couple of problems. Number one, where do you go to see anything that you'd like to purchase? Because all you're going to get is an image on a screen from now on. And some things I want to see, I might want to well, hear uh, uh, before I, I make yeah, the but, but, I, but I've said before, what, what Best Buy has become is the showroom for Amazon. Right, you right. Know, but I want something, when, I, when, I was, when I was looking for a TV set, I couldn't tell how good it looked, uh, how good the screen looked or whatever. So I, I went over to Best Buy and I looked at the very set I wanted to buy and I went, that looks oh. nice. And then I went home and ordered it on Amazon. I didn't it's need Best Buy. You yeah, didn't give them a chance gone. to match the price? Uh, uh, yeah, they couldn't. Yeah. They once could. they're gone, yeah. those prices at Amazon aren't going to be as good as they are now. Hey, listen, That's... I know Jim's got to go do a show, right, Jim? Yeah, I got to go. So he's got to probably go. And we'll, you, he'll I be on in a couple come. minutes. Still. And I hope you people will stick around and call him and everything because he's got – He, I really love his show. I'm jealous, <laughs> Jim. It's that good. It's that good. He's got a nice oh. lightsaber. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I we're not talking about that stuff, Patrick. We'll see you, oh, Alex. Let's see you in about two, enough. about two and a half minutes. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Hey, bye. Uh, Jim will be on next. Uh, uh, yes, Mark, you want? I, you've been wanting to say something, and I, I need. Uh, it, it's just that one of the co-owners lives down here, at Best Buy. Yeah. And he's been trying to buy back the company, mm -hmm. and he's been saying, "You'll come back to me, and I'm going to pay less than half the value, so you can buy it to me now, or." I'll buy you guys back for pennies on the dollar. And he's yeah. serious. Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, but it, it, it's not a good day for Best Buy. It's not a no. good day for all the, what we call the, uh, what the big box stores. It hasn't um, been a good couple of months for Target. Uh, <laughs> I think we will see Best Buy go out of business. Uh, I can't see how they're going to stay in business. No. They, they, they can't because, one... If you don't provide good customer service, yeah. even if Amazon didn't exist, I mean, they fail right yeah. there. So, yeah, uh, our, our newest, our newest, uh, our newbie here, David, is sitting by the window, and this is cool. You're sitting by the window smoking. I think. Yes. Yeah. I I smoke like my grandma yeah. three cigarettes a day after every meal. Yeah. It gets you a little bit high. <laughs> Marijuana is still illegal, illegal in Pennsylvania, so it gets me a little bit high. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, at, at three cigarettes a day, I'm not going to tell you it's going to kill you. Oh, thank you. Uh, but don't go to four. That'll kill you. No, no, I won't. <laughs> you know, we should discuss this some other time. I was two packs a day at one point. Uh, wow. So, 
You know, we say wow today, but back then that was cheap. You know, you didn't have to spend much money to get two packs a day. And, and Alex, Alex yeah. if I may, since my English is my second language, how do yeah. you spell juju jujubes? Your uh, favorite yeah. language. <laughs> I was looking for it and I couldn't find it because I don't know how to spell it. J u j u b e e s is how you spell it. Hey, listen, we gotta go. That's the end of the no. show. Now, listen, I hope you all stick around. Call Jim. Participate in the show. He's just, it's such, he's so wonderful, and he's such a sweet guy. And I hope all you people listening now will listen there. He won't have TV. And by the way, we haven't talked about the TV all night, but it has lasted and kept running all night. Do-da, do-da. So anyway, thanks to all of you for being here. And uh, we'll see you again on Monday. Thank you, David. Come back again, will you, please? Thank now, you, Alex. You do it. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Goodbye, hey. Rick. Goodbye, Mark. Goodbye, Patrick. Goodbye, Dave in Portland. Now, Goodbye, Scott. You hardly, we hardly were able to talk to you tonight. Josh Wheeler, Jeff thank Ford. you. Bye, everybody. And I'll see you again tomorrow. Uh, not tomorrow. See you again on